Okay, it's recording, All right? Sounds good. Yeah. All right, Bob Dylan discography download, really. All right, welcome everyone. So my name is Will, and today we're going to be going through the Bob Dylan discography, which is quite extensive. I'm not sure that we'll get through all of it, but we're certainly going to try. And of course, we're starting right here in 1962 with Bob Dylan's debut album. Uh, mostly covers, uh, but there are two solid originals. Uh, it was very primitive recording done in New York City that cost Columbia Records about $400. Um, there's, it's all guitar and harmonica, of course. Um, uh, Dylan had remarked he couldn't find a harmonica bracket, so they had to wind up using a uh, kind of a lopsided coat hanger that they'd fashioned in to hold the harmonica on him. So here is a 20-year-old kid who sounds, occasionally sounds like, who has the gruff voice of like a much older man, an old man, really. Um, this is not a masterpiece by any, by any stretch, but it's pretty solid. Uh, it didn't sell well, and of course the A&R rep, VP, from Columbia wanted to drop Dylan immediately after its release. My favorite tunes are um, Baby Let Me Follow You Down. It's got a nice little bit about uh, being recorded on the lush green pastures of Harvard University, which I've always laughed about. And then Talking uh, New York, which is an original, and it's also Song to Woody, which is an original. Um, all right, so there's number one. Let's get that number one out of the way. Uh, we're drinking a little Heaven's Door whiskey today. Uh, in honor of Bob, so that's what that is. You'll hear that clinking glass with some frequency. <laughs> um, next up, we have the Free Wheeling, and that's uh, without a G, Free Wheeling, Bob Dylan, uh, from 1963. Uh, I also want to just remark that most of my albums, there's nothing particularly special about them, meaning um, they're not 180 gram vinyl. Some of them are not even very good condition, as you'll see. Uh, but they are the records, uh, and I've had them for some of them a very long time, maybe 30 years at this point, probably too long. I've drug them all over the country uh, every time I move. So, anyway, compared to the first one, this one is loaded because now there's only two covers and the rest originals um, versus the other way around on the last album, and a couple of them. Uh, uh, very well-known tunes, Blowing in the Wind, A Masters of War, and A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. Uh, tunes that have withstood, without a doubt, the sands of time. Um, uh, this was done just three months after the other record came out, or, or I should say just three months after this record came out, Dylan was uh, singing um, at Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. right after MLK's speech about the I Have a Dream speech. That's a pretty extraordinary fact right there. Um, so this is, um, oh yeah, my favorite tune is not on here, it's an outtake, it's called Mixed Up Confusion. Uh, it's available on Biograph, we'll get to that in a bit, but uh, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful kind of rave up. But I do like the tunes, Girl from the North Country, Girl from the North Country, North Country, and Don't Think Twice, It's Alright, another favorite. Um, there were a bunch of alternative copies at the time that have four different tunes on them, and of course now they're worth a fortune. So if you have one, I don't, but um, um, you've got you're holding on to a little gold mine there. So, okay, next up we have from 1965, we have the times they are a changing, um, and I think this is really when it starts to kick in, right? Uh, obviously, Dylan at this point was only 23 years old, a very young man. Um, it has, of course, the very iconic title track. All of the uh, compositions on this record are original. There are no covers anymore. Um, and this is when I believe that the, the albums became really loaded from top to bottom. And there were five records from here through Blonde and Blonde that were all very, very um, amazing lyrics, amazing songs, and, and, and really timeless stuff that many of them he plays today, to this day, on tour. So this has tunes like Hollis Brown, One Too Many Mornings, Only a Pawn in the Game, Lonesome Death. Um, all are extraordinary, memorable compositions and favorites of man, many. My favorite on this record, record in particular is called With God on Our Side. Um, and that uh, was covered some years ago by a San Francisco band called Wire Train. I always love their version as well, um, if anybody's heard of them. Uh, so we're moving on to 1964 with another side of Bob Dylan. Uh, this particular album, and you can see it's uh, kind of discolored here. Uh, is it really special to me because it belonged to my uncle. So my uncle bought this um, back in the day. Maybe not the week it was out or whatever, but in the 
rough proximity to when it was released. Um, this record is perhaps a little less socially conscious than those one those before it, but I would argue no less important. So uh, there is a um, there's Chimes of Freedom is on here. It ain't me, babe, and uh, these and my back pages that would be around forever really stand the test of time. Uh, it ain't me, babe, has already been performed over a thousand times in concerts. So, and that statistic is probably a little old. My favorites are actually two tunes when he laughs somewhere in the tune, and uh, all I really want to do. Uh, he laughs at the three minute 40 second mark. <laughs> We're getting very specific today. And then I don't believe you where he laughs at the two minute and nine second mark. But this is a very special record uh, through and through. So, All right, now back to 1965. Brand bringing it all back home. A great cover, literally a great cover. So the woman is Sally Grossman, who is Albert's wife. Albert was Dylan's manager long, long, long ago. Um, and then the cat that he's holding, his name, actual name is Rolling Stone. So this now is half and half, half electric, half acoustic. And so he's starting to move away from being a folky, so to speak, and further kind of moving into rock and roll, right? But this is regarded, truly regarded as one of the greatest rock and roll albums in history. Less protest songs, um, still contains, though, Mr. Tambourine Man, Gates of Eden, It's All, uh, it's All Right, Mom, and It's All Over Now. I personally enjoy Subterranean Homesick Blues, which kicks off this record. It was also, uh, it's a rollicking tune, as you know. Um, it um, also was probably the first ever music video that was ever made that's very entertaining, and I'm sure you've seen it. So, um, Maggie's Farm on this. Also, I love One Take, uh, one take Recording. And of course, uh, Bob Dylan's 115th Dream, where he, he again laps it up. But I do want to say, I've been watching the uh, YouTube videos of John uh, Heaton from the UK, or from Hungary, and um, he's a little less enthusiastic about Outlaw Blues and On the Road again, a couple of songs on here that I really like. Um, but I do recommend you checking out his videos. He doesn't do just Bob Dylan, he does all kinds of things, but very much worth worthy of uh, your attention. So, okay. Now we get on over to 1965 with an album called Highway 61 Revisited. You'll notice that my cover is a little uh, Seen Some Better Days. I bought it like this, so whoever had kind of taken some kind of um, packing, I, I actually think it's book binding tape or material that it's kind of holding it together. Um, so this is an electric rock and roll album, right? And um, it was recorded in six sessions, 140 takes of the 12 songs. Uh, and of course it has Like a Rolling Stone, which has been performed more than 1,700 times in concert, an awful lot. Um, actually, I got that wrong. Highway 61 revisited the tune recorded more than 1,700 times. And Like a Rolling Stone, which was his first 45, um, that first 45 that was split in two because the song was so long. So the A side had the first half of the song and then the B side, you flip it over, had the second half of the song, which is such a strange thing. But that tune has been recorded, or I should say played in concert at least 2,000 times. Uh, Highway 61 also has that whistle or car siren that I think Al Cooper came up with. That's very, uh, uh, very unique and well known. Uh, of course, a version exists without it. We'll get to that after a while. Um, but this is certainly one of the most highly acclaimed albums of the Bob Dylan period. I know I've said that already a few times, but uh, this was a very magical time for Dylan. Um, also, if you go to, just like Tom Thumb's Blues, you will hear a little line. This is my favorite line in the, in the, uh, in the, on the record that the Beastie Boys used one time, too, uh, as a sample. And it's, I'm going back to New York City. I do believe I had enough. So I've always really loved just the, the sort of sar the sarcasm and the wit behind that. Um, some of these titles uh, also kind of uh, were influenced by a film, a personal favorite film of mine, uh, Orson Welles touch of evil so that's worth noting um, so highway 61 runs from thunder bay ontario roughly by uh, duluth way up north up there all the way down to new orleans it's 1400 miles um, it's quite a quite a long haul that's what the, the highway 61 it's also where the crossroad of the blues uh, is in mississippi um, robert johnson and many others who lived there or, or played there and grew up along that road um, 
There is a version that has an alternative take of from a Buick 6 on it in, in on the early pressing. This is not that, of course. <laughs> That's um, you know quite uh, valuable to, to collectors. Um, and then we come to from 1966. We're almost up to the year I was born. Gasp. Um, blonde on Blonde. Uh, this is the first double album of rock and roll. Let's take a look at it as such. Quite large. Um, earlier pressings actually have a photograph of Dylan with a woman here, uh, but she sued to have it stopped. So if you have one of those pressings, it's quite valuable. Um, mine does not have that because, as I said, none of my records are worth anything. I do want to show you the 45 that went with it, though, which I've always loved. This has always been one of my favorite covers. Um, ever since I first saw it in a store in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, it wasn't actually for sale, but I was like, oh, I need to get that record. So this is I Want You and uh, a, a 45 that's with um, Just Like Tom Thumbs Blues on the, on the flip side, actually. So, but I really love this. I think this is just a wonderful photograph, to, to be honest with you. Um, but Blonde on Blonde, right, from 1966, it has this kind of blurry cover. Uh, the, the photograph is blurry. It, here it just looks worn. You can kind of see the ring wear on both sides. But um, this record, uh, that, that was actually, I don't want to say done on purpose, but Dylan picked out the shot. He picked out the blurry one. Um, so anyway, some of my favorite tunes are Pledging My Time, which of course has in, in incredible lyrics. I Want You, the 45 we just talked about, which got to number 20 on the Billboard charts in the United States here. Uh, Memphis Blues again, a song I absolutely love. I used to live in Memphis for one of the reasons, but that comes up a lot in all this. So we'll, you'll, not the first time you're going to hear that, or the last time you're going to hear that, maybe the first. Um, most likely, you go your way and I go mine. I, what can I say? That title, I love the title. The song is equally as good. Absolutely Sweet Marie, which is a song that Jason and the Nashville Scorchard covered sometime later, which another tune, I think they did a splendid job of that. And last but not least, obviously Five Believers. And so what's interesting about this album is that uh, Bringing It All Back Home, Highway 61, and Blonde on Blonde were all released within a 14 or 15 month period. So it was an incredibly productive time in the career of Dylan. And I think that's why, uh, and we'll get to this later, but a lot of the live recordings or a lot of the things that are always kind of looked at with extraordinary amount of praise by fans and critics alike sort of always kind of go back to this period of time, which was super important. Um, so also at the t it has uh, one whole side, side four is Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowland, which is 11 minutes long. And I guess to this point, that is the longest Dylan song, although that record will not in terms of like actual studio, studio recorded uh, records. That will not last forever, but for now that 11 minute sad-eyed lady of the lowlands is, is number one. So, Moving on to 1967, my year, a year I'm very proud of, is uh, John Wesley Harding. And um, let's take a look at that right there. Okay. So the first thing I want to say about the cover is I read an interesting story that the person who took the photograph um, didn't think it had much value and sold it not long thereafter in an auction for 50 bucks. And so he's kind of bummed <laughs> about that. This whole record was recorded in nine and a half hours. Um, I think it's equally distinct from anything that he'd done to that point and anything he would do for, some, for quite a long time. Uh, it came 18 months after uh, Blonde on Blonde we just talked about and includes All Along the Watchtower, of course, a song that Jimi Hendrix made famous, um, to say the least. Uh, Dylan's played that song more than 2,000 times in concert, and again, those figures are probably a little dated at this point. My personal favorites are I Dreamed I Saw St. Augustine, Frankie Lee and Judas Priest. I used to have two fish named Frankie Lee and Judas Priest, actually, and Down Along the Cove. Um, since we're talking about covers, the Water Boys did a terrific cover of uh, I'll Be Your Baby Tonight. Um, this remains one of Darren, Dylan's most enduring albums, and it's also, oddly, the uh, last one that's both you could buy stereo and mono. Most of the stuff I've shown you is all stereo. Um, I wish I had the monos. I don't. I think one of them is a mono, but the rest of them are not. But needless to say, the mono version of this record in particular fetches a pretty penny at this point. So, all right. Uh, in 1967, we had... This Greatest Hits, right? I want to say it could have come before the last one. I just got the dates. 
the years. So some of them, it, it might have flipped the other way. We'll get, that's going to happen in here. I can tell already. But this came out in 67. It's all previously released tunes, um, except, uh, or I shouldn't say not accept anything, but the times they are changing, as you know, or perhaps you don't, was a big, big hit for Peter, Paul, and Mary. It Ain't Me, Babe was a big hit for the Turtles. And then Mr. Tambourine Man, which was a big hit for the birds. Um, do I have? No, I just have one of these. Okay. So, greatest hits. I'm a little less, in general, enthusiastic about greatest hits records and live albums. We're going to talk about a lot of them. I might gloss through them really fast because they, they sort of kind of lower on my list. But Let's keep moving over to Nashville Skyline from 1969. One of Dylan's shortest albums. This one's kind of got like some marks. <laughs> it's, it is not mint. None of them are. Uh, but the, I think the question between, uh, it has been suggested perhaps the first uh, Americana album, right? Nashville Skyline. A very short 27 minutes. It has a duet with Johnny Cash. It also has an instrumental. Uh, the duet is Girl from the North Country. That's a second appearance of that song in the, kind of the Dylan collection. Dylan said his voice had changed a lot because he quit smoking cigarettes. So he said he was starting to sound like Caruso. <laughs> Which, <laughs> or he could sound as good as Crusoe, so um, I thought that was awesome. Apparently, Dylan and Cash had recorded a bunch of stuff around this period as well together, and I'm hope someday that in the you know in the masses of bootleg series that'll come out. So we'll see. I'm sure that bootleggers already have it, but officially I'm speaking. So um, there is. Oh yeah, uh, there's some funny dialogue in this where Bob asks, Bob Dylan asks Bob Johnson, the producer, is it rolling, Bob? And I just, I, I, it's, they kind of left that in there, which I always like when it's, it makes it, gives it a lot more kind of loose feel. Um, but this is a pleasant listen through and through, and certainly a record that kind of opened the country door to many, whether it be bands or fans or what have you. Um, but a lot of people really like this record. My favorite tunes are I Threw It All Away, which was the first single, uh, Lay Lady Lay, which was the second single. Um, it's got this kind of horseshoe clip clop drum beat, which I love. And then Country Pie, which was actually the B-side of the third single. So, Okay, so then we get over to Self Portrait, which I love the cover. I do not like the record, and I've never liked the record. Um, this is a double album. There are some live tunes kind of sprinkled in. You'll see my, my copy has like marker all over it. Somebody must have wrote their name and then they changed their mind. They wanted to sell it so they crossed out their team. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, but um, this is, he's already eight years in and ten albums in, in terms of his recording career, right? So there's been a lot going on. And it's hard to believe that one person had wrote the 56 songs that made up you know, again, we keep saying it, Bring It All Back Home, Highway 61 Revisited, Blonde on Blonde, John Wesley Harden, Nashville Skyline, right? From 65 to 69. So, um, also about this time, Dylan had moved from Woodstock, right, to New York City. And he, he was sort of getting what they now call being stalked. I don't know if they called it then, but he was basically getting stalked in Woodstock. And so people would stop at his house at all odd times of day and night. At this point, he'd had... I don't. I can't remark on exactly how many children, but at least three, I think, maybe four at this point by sixty, by in the late '60s. So he had moved to New York City. Of course, unfortunately, the circus followed him, so he was unable to get rid of it. Um, a couple of the covers on here, which are unusual, is "Let It Be Me" and "Blue Moon." So we've heard Blue Morrissey sing "Blue Moon." You can hear Bob Dylan sing it here. Um, and then the, the wigwam tune was actually used, if you care, in um, uh, Royal Tannenbaum's, a movie by, um, you know, the guy, Anderson. So, okay. So I want to switch from this to, I want to go over to my pile of stuff and see if I can just find, yes, I can. So here is, this is our foot, first bootleg series that we're going to talk about today. Um, here is another self-portrait. So yours truly sort of thought a self-portrait was Paul Lunty. So this one is a bit of a stretch for me. Um, there was an advanced 45 that went with it, so let's take a look at that. If I can pull it out here. Do, do, do. Yeah, 
here it is. Speaking of Wigwam, speaking of uh, Wes Anderson is the fellow's name. Uh, here's Wigwam. This is an Advanced 45 that came out after it. This would have been in 2013. So we get Wigwam on one, Thirsty, so Thirsty Boots on the other side. So nice little record. Nice little record. Anyway, another self-portrait. So these are more recordings from roughly like 69 to 70, right? This is bootleg volume number 10, um, the much hated or loved, depending on who you are, uh, uh, self-portrait. So it's unreleased demo, as all the bootlegs are, we'll just say it right now and get over with, unreleased songs, demos, alternative takes, live tunes, etc. right? So in this case, it was both from self-portrait and New Morning, right? Kind of mashed together, I should say this is. Um, the liner notes are composed by Grill Marcus, Grill, whose name I'm, I'm sure I'm saying wrong, who's like a hotshot rock music scribe, who back in the day reviewed Self-Portrait by saying, what is this shit? <sighs> Stupid. Um, you know, that's fine. Rock criticism has changed a lot, especially since the dawn of the internet, because back in the day, of course, you'd read a review and there was, if you wanted to respond, you could write a letter to the editor that would never be published. Uh, now, of course, if somebody's talking shit about your favorite band, you can just write in the comments right there. So the days are different. I think they're a little less... Um, there's a lot of hotshot rock star critics from back in the day, and we'll talk about some of them. But anyway, they allowed him to write the, line, the liner the linear, the lin liner notes for this album. Um, while we're talking about the bootleg series, the, generally speaking, they always come with a really fantastic book, right, and a disc. Uh, they also generally, there's also usually a couple of different versions. The basic version, which I own all of those, but there's also like the deluxe or the super, super collector d d edition. Um, these are much more obviously p lower priced and easier to, easier for me to handle. But anyway, so they allowed him to write the liner notes on this. Um, I did want to, I wanted to talk a little bit about Paul Westerberg talking about rock critics as, le as literary bench warmers because I always thought that was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I'm here critiquing records, so I should probably watch it. But, um, but speaking, um, some critics remark that uh, the right songs were chosen for the real album. <laughs> what does that say about this one? Probably not so much. But for a record I don't like, I sure have a lot of rec songs on here I do like. So let's get to those. And uh, one of them is I went to see the Gypsy. Uh, there are two versions on here, a demo version and an organ version, which I think are great. Time passes slowly from New Morning. There are two versions on here. One is like a moderate rocker and one is kind of a big rave up. Um, I threw it all away from Nashville Skyline. If not for you from New Morning, um, Country Pie from Nashville Skyline. If Dogs Run Free from New Morning and uh, also the title track from New Morning, New Morning. Um, so this was, I sort of thought this was funny because it was a released sort of to remind us um, that those about who complain the dismalness of the real, another, uh, I should say another, not another, but just self-portrait um, was kind of unwarranted and unfair. And I sort of feel that that's the, that's a, that's a bit of the case. So speaking of case, I'm not even going to try to get this to fit. Ooh, I did. Uh, never mind. Okay. So let's get back on track over here. Speaking of New Morning, uh, here is New Morning. From 1970, there is a photo on the backside of uh, blues singer Victoria Spivey and Bob Dylan on the front, just Bob Dylan. You'll notice there's no text at all on that. Um, so, so, some smarty rock critic said, uh, and their headline was, uh, we got Dylan back again. So, this is the return. We can forget about self-portrait for a little while. This, I think, is a pretty solid album. Um, however, much of the recording of this album was done, you know, while this was being done. So there you go. Anyway, my favorite tunes, and I've already mentioned some of them, but Time Passes Slowly, I went to see The Gypsies. If Dogs Run Free, which is this little piano ditty that sounds like it fell off um, Tom Waits' pickup truck, although of course Dylan predates Tom Waits, but it has that feel, feel to it. If Not For You, which is, has xylophone in it, uh, George Harrison also recorded that tune. He's sort of present around this time as well. Um, maybe not specifically on this, although, no, I don't, not specifically on this, but he's definitely around at this time. Um, the title track, New Morning, and then Father of Night, which only runs a minute and 32 seconds, but I think is, is pretty terrific, right? Uh, One More Weekend to me sounds a little bit like Groom still waiting at the altar. I don't know if anyone else has had that same thought. Um, next up, 
we have more greatest hits. And so this is from, um, I actually have two of these. This is from 1971. This is called Greatest Hits number two. One of these is Canadian. That and a dollar will get you a coffee at 7-Eleven. So um, it has all previously re released material except one side is new and unreleased material. Or just, I shouldn't say new, but unreleased. Um, tomorrow's a long time. Uh, a song I like, When I Paint My Masterpiece, I Shall Be Released. Um, you Ain't Going Nowhere, another song I like. And then Down in the Flood, Crash on the Levee. Floods, there's a lot of flooding going on with Bob Dylan. So this, this is not the first time we're going to hear about the flood. And it certainly won't be the last. Um, and also there was a 45 or Watching the River Flow. Again, flowing water. Uh, anyway, this is real nice. 1971, Greatest Hits 2. Uh, then we get over to Dylan's first soundtrack, right? It is called... Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. And there is a 45 that accompanies that. Let's take a quick look at that. This is from Spain. This is not in good condition at all. And so you'll see on one side is, uh, is the same album cover. And then on the other is Dylan with that harmonica rack around his neck. This is, of course, the very famous Knocking on Heaven's Door, which is a song that's been covered by many, many, many people. Um, and is still a popular tune uh, when you go to see Dylan live. Um, also, on the, I should show you that on the back side, we kind of see Chris Christopherson getting a gun pointed at him. This is a shot from the film. I like the film, but, you know, apparently the studio didn't. So they recut it. It was Peckinpah's movie. They recut it and made a goddamn mess of it, like they always do. Uh, I don't know if it's been released. Um, if Peckinpah, if, you know, if he went back and redid it. But this is from 73. Um, Dylan is also in this movie. He has a tiny little part. Uh, it's kind of funny. I'm sure a lot of that ended up on the cutting room floor. But um, he, he, does, he does make an appearance. They um, recorded, or I should say Dylan recorded, started recording this in Mexico City. It wasn't particularly fruitful. So they moved over to Burbank. Um, I like a lot of it and thought it was really, like I said, I thought it was a perfect fit for the film. I really did. Um, some critics were knocking it at the time, including my favorite Robert Christ Goo, I call him, and Springsteen Whippin' Boy John Landau. They all talk shit about it. So it's just a film soundtrack, fellas. It's not like, you know, remain calm. It's not a proper album or whatever. But Turkey Chase, I think, is fabulous. And I think that final, fi final theme is also fabulous. After this, Dylan is starting to make his move away from Columbia over to Asylum Records, and we'll get into that, of course. So this is a miserable record, and it's called Dylan. I love the cover, his painting. I always love his painting, when he did, or his sketching on there. Yeah, um, th it's great. So this is the c contractual obligation album, right? Um, there's controversy. <laughs> <laughs> There's controversy or dispute among fans over whether this is a studio album or a compilation. <laughs> All right, that's a very obscure. I'm not sure why that matters, but you know, fans like me have a lot of time on their hands. So also, I noted that if you <laughs> if you're interested in seeing, reading, or trying to determine what the running order for the eight track is, that's on Wikipedia. So. Great. Okay, so this has a couple of tunes. Big Yellow Taxi, a Joni Mitchell song. Uh, Fool Such As I, which was a Hank Snow hit, and then later Elvis. Uh, Ballad of Ira Hayes, Johnny Cash. Can't Help Falling In Love With You, Elvis Presley. And of course, Mr. Bojangles, that was Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Um, you know, it just is what it is. It was not, uh, it's a contractual obligation filler. And there'll, we'll, we'll, there'll be a, there might be another one or two of those. We'll find out as we move along. Uh, so anyway, we're going on to 1974, right? And this album is called Planet Waves. It has original art by Dylan, uh, both on both sides, actually. Or he did it. 
This is, I have the Columbia version, so I need to get the Asylum version. I don't have that. But at the top, it actually says previously available on Asylum 7E1003. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, David Geffen lured them away from Columbia. Dylan kind of thought that Columbia was doing kind of a shit job of promoting the records, especially recently. And, it, and his, his contract was about to be up, and he was looking for better deals. So this wound up being Dylan's number, first number one U.S. Billboard hit in the United States, and that does say a lot, I think. Um, there are some timeless and beloved tunes on here, like Forever Young, which there's two versions, a slow and a fast, played a lot still to this day. Um, I like uh, On a Night Like This, and also maybe Dirge, some of my favorite tunes. So, Okay, so then we come up to before the Flood from 1974. This is on Asylum. My version is on Asylum. And this is not a particularly interesting or good record, I don't think. Um, I'm, also, I'm always a sucker for uh, Most Likely You Go Your Way and I'll Go Mine. We talked about that earlier, which on this record was oddly recorded just three or four miles here at the Forum, which is in Inglewood, California, the Great Western Forum. Um, this is from 1974, if I didn't mention it. The band is the band. The band is the band, um, and it was bootlegged a lot, right? Um, oddly, uh, Dylan's in, in top vo vocal form, I believe, on this record, but oddly, he didn't play anything from Planet Waves, the record we just talked about, or at least it wasn't on this record. It's a double record, which, trust me, is plenty. And so we have pictures of Dylan with the band. The front cover is kind of cool. You can see, uh, like, lighters. Now this would be cell phones. <laughs> this would be cell phones now, but that back then it was lighters. So of the crowd. Um, again, not a big fan of live records in general. Um, but I'm playing along, so. Next up, we have the Basement Tapes from 1975. This was, record again, another a nice double album. Quite a good record cover, I believe. And really, in, in gatefold as well, kind of in, kind of interesting uh, photograph. So this was recorded with the band. The band are back in 1967 um, in Woodstock. It was bootleg. They bootlegged the shit out of it, right? So eventually, Columbia's like, let's just release it. Uh, there's usually there's a little gap, although there's not in this case because the next one comes right up. But generally, there's a little gap, right? Uh, I always feel like the live records and the greatest hits are either contractual obligations or there's like a little gap in recording, in the release of albums. They're like, we need product, right? The label gets all antsy because there's the, no cash coming in the door. So um, they recorded 100 plus songs, which is crazy, right? And a lot of them have kind of nonsense lyrics. I don't love this record. So of course, anything I don't love they waste no time in giving us a bootleg version of it, so let's find that. Here it is. That'll be next. Anyway, for a record I don't love, there sure is a lot of songs on here. Like Million Dollar Bash, Lo and Behold, Apple Suckling Tree, uh, You Henry and a Bottle of Bread, I'll drink to that. Tiny Montgomery, You Ain't Going Nowhere, Nothing Was Delivered, which has a piano track that's a kind of similar, I believe, to Blueberry Hill. And then uh, This Wheel's on Fire, which, you know, is played, it's been covered quite a bit, actually. So, all right. So that's Basement Taste from 75, but really 67, I believe. So, as I said earlier, things I don't like, they seem to get more of them. So here comes the Basement Tapes Raw, which is bootleg series number 11. So we have number 11, and this is from 2014. Uh, it expands on this 1975 release that we just talked about, right? And they're unreleased home co recordings basically of Dylan and the band. Um, the complete version, which this is not, has uh, 138 tracks. That's six and a half hours. If that won't do it, tell me what will. And this is the raw version. It has 38 tracks, so much more manageable. The book, interestingly enough, the uh, notes were written by Sid Griffin, who is, uh, is the singer in The Long Riders, another band I really like a lot. So. They're, and they're back on the road. They got a new album out in 2018, but we're not talking about them. 2019, rather. A um, couple of the tunes I do like on here is uh, John Lee Hooker's uh, Tupelo, although I can't say it's good, but it's interesting. And then also Sign um, on the Cross. So Dylan does a little preaching in that, which is interesting because there's going to be a lot more preaching coming soon. So that's Basement Tapes. This one's called Raw, of all things. And let's get over to 1975. 
and Blood on the Tracks. All right, this album. This album is something else. Terrific record, right? Absolutely. Very solid. I say loaded through and through. A number one Billboard hit. Double platinum, of course. Uh, he recorded the entire album in New York City and then went home to visit his brother in Minnesota, Minneapolis, over the holidays, and his brother said some of the songs sound too slick. <laughs> so they went in to re-record some of the songs at Sound 80 in Minneapolis. So I want to talk a little bit about Sound 80. I used to live in Minneapolis, and I used to go to school there, and I actually, trade school, and I actually had an instructor who worked at Sound 80, and so we had some stories not as many about this, but he did have stories about Cat Stevens, who had recorded their uh, Prince's uh, demo for the album For You. That was actually his first record, was recorded there as well. I'm sure that they'll be trotting that thing out before all too long. Uh, Warner Brothers or whoever, the estate, whoever has the holdings. But um, that place is on, I'm going to be very specific about this, 28th Street and 35th Avenue South. So it's not there anymore, but the buildings are still there if you want. The Sound 80 still is in business. Um, and they do all kinds of production accounting and whatever, recording as well, but uh, it's a kind of a different. The business has changed somewhat, but you certainly can drive over there and check out the buildings. Uh, this is a great record uh, through and through. My tune, my favorite tunes are Tangled Up in Blue, right, which was recorded in Minneapolis. And also You're a Big Girl Now, also recorded in Minneapolis. Not that I'm talking about Minneapolis too much, but I definitely will talk about Minneapolis too much. Um, so we had, today, we had a, a brand new arrival, which arrived literally an hour ago, not even an hour ago. And so this is from this year's Record Store Day. It is Blood on the Tracks, the test pressing. And this is basically the New York version, right? And what's interesting about this is, is that they were about, I want to say, according to the geniuses out there, there were five of these floating around, um, the test pressing, right, from that, from 1975, of the New York studio recordings that were going to be the album until Dylan got talked out of it. Um, and the last one had sold just a few years ago for 12 grand, so I don't have that. <laughs> I have this. This is the new version of the same old thing, right, so I don't have the $12,000 one, but this is so interesting, right? This is such a terrific record. And most recently, of course, in the spirit of, um, in the spirit of trying to find records in this hot mess of stuff, let's find, this was released as a, hmm, excuse me for the rude interruption. Oh, here it is, certainly. So uh, it was recently released as a bootleg series. This is bootleg number 14. I want to say this is the most recent version. And this is, as you can see, the minute, the tiny, the basic version, right? Of uh, More Blood, More Tracks, right? And recorded in September and December of, of uh, 1974. So in the, in the big one, there are six discs and 84 recordings. This is the basic one, right? Um, it is hard, there are multiple versions of these songs. It is hard to go wrong with these songs, period, right? They're just, they're, they're very solid. Um, I'm looking forward to listening to this, right? But the truth of the matter is, is that this was a fantastic record. I think uh, we can all agree on that. So that, so basically, this is just more of this. Right? Um, it's fun to listen to these. Uh, the only complaint I've heard is that it occasionally gets repetitious and tedious. Uh, listening to the same versions. One smarty pants on uh, uh, Amazon said, do we re need, really need 12 versions of um, You're Gonna Make Me Lonesome or Bucket of Rain? Uh, that's for you to decide, not for me to decide. So at one point in several of the songs you can hear button, uh, buttons from Dylan's shirt hitting the back of the guitar. I think those were all unusable takes, but the songs are still terrific. Um, and, then, and also I just wanted to mention that there's an entire book that someone wrote about the fact that the Minneapolis musicians did not get credit for the record uh, because they'd already started to print the sleeves. And so all the New York musicians are credited, but the Minneapolis musicians are not. Of course, they've been credited in the, in the latest update version of it. So 84 tracks on the big one, that's a lot. This one just clocks in at 11 tracks, but super fun to listen to and you know, just really great Dylan history. Um, so let's cap that off with a live record from 1976. 
This one is actually not so bad. It is fast and loose, as I like to say, right? Um, part of it was recorded in Fort Worth, Texas, and part of it was recorded in Fort Collins. Um, Fort Collins, it was the where the CSU Rams used to play, Hughes Stadium, but it's gone now. I used to go to school there, the only reason I care. Um, I've been to that stadium, it's gone now. There is an NBC TV special about it, uh, and you can watch it on YouTube. You should check it out, it's kind of a gray day, like it is today here in Los Angeles. Uh, outside, it doesn't seem like it's particularly uh, sellout crowd at all, it's daytime. It's just kind of unusual to watch. And then I, I've also found online the Fort Worth, um, part of the show was recorded at uh, the Tarrant County Convention Center and the tickets were $8.75 which seems pretty reasonable. <laughs> uh, Mick Ronson is on this record from David Bowie uh, on Maggie's Farm. I like the Memphis Blues again. I said that a hundred times. That's on here. And You're a Big Grill Now. I think those are some great versions um, on this record. So I've had this for a super long time as well. Um, let's move on though because we're all the way up to 1976. So we're only, what is that, 40 years behind? <laughs> we're an hour in and 40 years behind. It's going to be a long day. Okay, so there is a 45 from this. Let's check that out first. Um, it is Hurricane, right? And this is another uh, record I said a little earlier that has a part one on the A and a part two on the B side. So it's a long song. Uh, it tells the story of Hurricane Carter who was... Uh, you know, uh, in Patterson, New Jersey, who had allegedly shot and killed three men in a bar um, with his accomplice. Uh, didn't actually happen like that. They were kind of looking for somebody to, to, uh, to a fall guy, so to speak. Uh, Dylan later made this kind of a cause, playing concerts and, and raising money to help his legal bout. And I think 20 years after the fact, Hurricane went free. So that's a good story. There is a movie, uh, Denzel plays Hurricane in a movie they made recently. Um, not recently, in the last 10 or 15, well, 10 or 20. Let's give it a bigger. Um, highly regarded and a fan favorite. This was also a number, a double platinum number one record right here, Desire. Uh, we talked about Hurricane. My favorite line, without a doubt, from this whole album is from that song, and it's, and it's you'll be doing society a favor, that son of a bitch is brave, getting braver. <laughs> Quite ugly. One of the magical parts of this record is Scarlett Rivera playing violin throughout on many tracks, and also Emmylou Harris, who you all know, uh, doing background vocals throughout. It's just a wonderful record. Um, it's a great collection of songs. It has Isis, it has One More Cup of Coffee, really all of the tunes. And if you happen to have the quadraphonic version of this, which I do not, uh, it's worth some money. So. Let's keep going uh, to 1978. When I was putting this all together, this is actually the record I started on, Street Legal. And the only reason I started on is because I wanted to remember where it was recorded. And so this photograph was taken outside of the recording studio, or I shouldn't say recording studio. It was a studio that Dylan had rented and they turned it in, they called it, it was a rehearsal, so they turned it into a recording studio. No, not really, rehearsal space more accurately. In Santa Monica, California. Uh, 2501 Main Street, right? It used to be like the Santa Monica ghetto, which cracks me up because of course now it's... Now, to be specific, because I've been by there, it is a Buffalo Exchange. They sell fancy used jeans, a nail and hair, nail and hair salon, and a Ben and Jerry ice cream. So if you want to go up, drop by there and get a little bit of the uh, deal, Dylan feel from the sidewalk, you can stand on that sidewalk. Uh, it was used as a rehearsal space for quite a long time, and they brought in a mobile kind of lab to record this album, which sounds pretty muddy, actually. Street Legal, is, if you don't know, is in reference to hot rods that are kind of uh, legal enough to drive on city streets, I guess, without being arrested or stopped. Uh, one of the things I love about this is goth we're kind of getting in now to gospel background singers or just more background singers that fill out the sound. Some people do not like it. I absolutely love it, and the more the merrier. Um, my favorite tunes, No Time to Think, Senor and Baby Stop Crying. Uh, is Your Love in Vain to me sounds a little bit like Emotionally Yours, which will come up to in a, in a, in a hot minute, but um, I like this record. Um, this one is actually in pretty good, pretty good condition considering the rest of my collection. So uh, Now another live album because I can't, just can't seem to get away from them. Um, and it's welded in here because I've never taken it out. <laughs> 
Budokan from 1979. Now, it's hard to beat Cheap Trick. That's all I can say. And this one doesn't do it either. So, it, these performances, the performances and the lyrics and uh, how it's delivered are radically different from the originals versions of those. There's a lot of brass, a lot of background singers. Some people, I generally have a tendency to relish different versions, especially in the live um, setting. I'm not sure it worked in terms of this album. It's a double, by the way. Take a look at Giant Dylan and his signature in the corner. He guarantees it's good. <laughs> I think this is what that means. Um, anyway, hated by many and loved by a few. There's some flute in here. <laughs> I had to say that. Um, I wanted to recommend a tune on here, but I just it kind of I listened to it and I just like it kind of failed to materialize. So I don't want to talk bad about it. It might be your favorite record, but there nothing really stood out to me. Uh, and I really did try, actually. Not twice, because that's way too much. But anyway, let's keep going over here to Slow Train Coming, 1979. I love this period of time. And there is a trio of albums um, that we're going to talk about, and a bootleg, and all this that have uh, everything to do with this. So Dylan sort of kind of converts, in a sense, to Christianity. There is much more background singers on these on this series of records. Um, he's kind of shifting his gears right into this gospel and rock and roll kind of thing. Heavily inspired by biblical texts. There's no doubt about it. Um, Dylan saw Dire Straits at the Roxy Theater. Uh, they were touring on their second album, Communique. I love Dire Straits, by the way. And so he had contacted Jerry Wexler from Atlantic Records, who has worked with a bunch of people, but also in Muscle, specifically Muscle Shoals, Alabama, um, in a recording studio that's very famous. Uh, Wilson Pickett's recorded there, Aretha Franklin, um, Percy Sledge, The Rolling Stones, on and on, had recorded there. So they took this down to record it down there. And um, with, of course, Mark Knopfler had, had agreed to come on board. Um, my Some of my favorite tunes on this, although we have a, yeah, we have a 45, so let's look at that. And then we'll talk about favorite tunes. Here is a, here is Slow Train Coming um, from the fourth coming album, Slow Train. There you go. This is actually the promo, so the B-side is not Do Right To Me Baby. It's just white label promo, both on both sides. So Kind of nice, though. I actually do like that song. Uh, my favorite tunes on this record, though, however, are Gotta Serve Somebody, Precious Angel, which you are gonna, if you are a Dire Straits fan, you will recognize that guitar work of Mark Knopfler like instantly on some of these tunes, but especially that one. Um, I Believe in You, Slow Train, we just talked about, Do Right To Me Baby, and When You Gonna Wake Up. So quite a, quite a large number of songs um, from this thing. Uh, the next one I'm a little less enthusiastic about called Saved uh, from 1980. You can always tell the ones I'm less enthusiastic about because they won't come out of the plastic. They haven't been played in forever. Uh, I like Solid Rock and In the Garden on this are some of my favorites. But again, this is a gospel tour, gospel rock and roll. We have background singers. Dylan has discovered Jesus Christ. Dylan has converted to, to Christianity. It's, um, the label, <laughs> the, I love the cover. You know, JC is reaching down to touch his constituents on the ground, <laughs> his followers. Uh, the label uh, in the middle 80s was like, eh. No, we're, we're, we're trying to downplay the, its religiousness of this album. So they made an alternative cover, which I wish I had. I need to get. But it's, then it's, it's same kind of painter, but Dylan on stage. So it's, they soften the blow a little. It's not quite so, so didactic. I like the didactic. But more uh, Muscle Shoals here, more Jerry Wexler from Atlantic. Um, and they had been on the road a lot. So all these tunes are already road tested when they, when they recorded them. You can tell. There's a photograph, speaking of the road of the current band uh, on the road playing. And Dylan, Dylan would get preachy. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that too. But uh, So next up we have um, Shot of Love, which has this pop art cover that I love. Um, and had a 45 in advance called Heart of Mine. And the groom is still waiting at the altar. I love this record. I love this record too, but the 45 is terrific. I love the tune Groom Still Waiting at the Altar. So here's what's odd about, I have a couple of these because one actually has Groom is Still Waiting and one of them they left it off. 
So the original, they left it off. I don't know why, because this is a kick-ass tune. But then subsequent copies, they put it back on, right? So there's one and one. But um, anyway, this came out in 81, as I said. It was the third in sort of this trio. All day long, I promised not helicopter coming by. All day long, I promised. It's a good time to take a break. I need a drink. We're going to pause for the helicopter. We may edit that out, but knowing me, the lazy editor, we probably won't. Um, this is the third in the in the kind of trio of uh, of these gospel tunes or these sort of cr Christian records. Um, I think that every grain of sand is a masterpiece. It is on this. Dylan sung it at Johnny Cash's funeral, which I think says a lot. Um, Trouble, a great tune. I already talked about Groom still waiting at the altar. Uh, Caribbean wind, which is. They didn't put on here, but was in the, on these sessions. It's on one of the extras. Uh, we'll get to that as a great song. But they were back to Rundown Studios in Santa Monica, Ben and & Jerry's and Buffalo Exchange, right, uh, for rehearsal and recording, but then they moved it. He was unhappy with it. In truth, the street legal record that we saw earlier is a little muddy sounding. So it was hurried, I'm sure, but also maybe just the facility in general wasn't quite up to snuff. So. Um, they moved, they started recording in various, I didn't even write it down, various studios throughout the greater Los Angeles area. So there's a tribute to Lenny Bruce on here, a great tune called Summertime. My favorites are, are Shot of Love, Heart of Mine, which has uh, Ringo, you know Ringo, and Ronnie, you know Ronnie, Stones and the Beatles, um, Property of Jesus, I love it, uh, Dead Man, Dead Man, right? Another outtake is You Changed My Life on this. So why don't we move from this, let's just move over to the bootleg version, um, which maybe is on top. Yeah, it is. It's called Trouble No More. Uh, and this is bootleg number 13 from 79 to 81. However, released in, let me be quite specific, recently, 2017. Yeah. And so I had a great, I had a lot of fun listening to this and still do, right? Uh, the, the big version has 102 tracks, which I have, but not. The physical and so this is has kind of the chip down version but still solid so it um, this alienated a lot of fans that we talked about um, some critics remarked that these recordings on here were better than the ones that were recorded in the studio which I believe I have a tendency to kind of agree with that um, it's a really enjoyable listen to me live shows and rehearsals unlike the other bootlegs um, where the outtakes are the main draw this is not for this collection so um, also, there's a movie that comes along with a deluxe version that I have not seen. Oddly, it played in theaters, but only for a day. It's, I see that's kind of like the new thing for a very small scale. But it wasn't in our market in Los Angeles, which I just thought was odd. So it did play in like Chicago, San Francisco, and New York for one night. But there is a DVD if you have the big version of this. Uh, it has Michael Shannon in it, <laughs> of all people, preaching in a you know, in a church, I guess, which seems kind of odd and also honestly reminiscent of the last Lucero record of all bands who had made one music video who has Michael Shannon doing like a, a voiceover. So there's a weird kind of uh, tie with that. But I do wanted to play, I do want to play, I'm only going to play one thing. So I want to play a radio spot because I think it's just telling. A one minute radio spot that is available on the, the big version of this, right? So let me pull that up and I'll just hold it up to my little lav mic here. Um, if I can find it without too much fanfare. Uh, but it's quite telling because it is basically a man on the street style radio spot. And you know, man on the street going to tell you what they think. So let's get that going right here. Fantastic. I mean, just fantastic history. Thank you for including that. It's like one minute that, you know, amazing. So let's move over. This is my favorite record. It is now 1983. This is Infidels.